Hello everyone, I'm Shane Isgrig, aka Shane the Skeptic, and I'd like to welcome you to the beginning of my debunking series. Today I'll be debunking homeopathy and reviewing a video posted by the School of Homeopathy YouTube channel called Homeopathy Answer to Critics. Homeopathy was developed during the late 18th century by a German physician named Samuel Hahnemann. In his time, medicine was far less advanced, with bloodletting being one of the most common medical practices around. Today, it's been established that bloodletting is not an effective treatment for any diseases. Not only does bloodletting not treat or cure any diseases, but it actually leaves the patient in worse health than they were in before their treatment. Hahnemann was dissatisfied with the state of medicine of the time, and he was especially opposed to bloodletting. This motivated him to come up with an alternative to the common medical practices of the time, and soon enough, homeopathy was born. While made with ingredients that could cause harm, homeopathic solvents are usually diluted so much that not even a single atom of the active ingredient is left. So on a physical level, these solvents usually won't cause any harm, but they won't do any good either. But only usually, there are cases like the one with a company named Matrix Initiatives in which they released a medicine called Zikum which contained zinc and actually caused people to lose their sense of smell as a result of consuming the product. Homeopathy was soon advertised as a non-invasive alternative to the common medical practices of the time. Patients who underwent homeopathic treatment were recovering at much higher rates than patients who underwent traditional practices like bloodletting since on a physical level homeopathic treatment wasn't doing anything while bloodletting actually caused harm. At the time that Hahnemann proposed homeopathy, he said that in order for it to work, patients had to stop eating meat, stop eating sweets, uh, they had to stop having caffeine, they had to stop having alcohol, they weren't allowed to masturbate, and they weren't allowed to read any pornographic texts. All of these rules are completely ignored by homeopaths today. But to be clear, if homeopaths are getting people to eat healthier before taking their medicine, that could explain why some people are actually getting healthier after taking the medicine. Not because of the medicine, but because they're eating healthier. It's a demonstrable fact that eating healthier will make a person healthier. So, what is homeopathy? Homeopathy is an alternative medicine which sets out to treat diseases by using small doses of natural substances which cause symptoms similar to the symptoms caused by the diseases. So, first, let's talk about the term alternative medicine. By definition, I begin. Alternative medicine, I continue, has either not been proved to work or been proved not to work. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. That's right. Anything being called alternative medicine does not have support from the scientific community. This is because in order to prove that something works, an explanation is required for how it works. So, how does world-famous homeopath Dr. Rajan Sankaran respond to this? Just try it. Do not bother about whether homeopathy is logical, whether it is within the tenets of science as we know it today, whether it is making sense or no sense. Simply watch the results. This is a completely unacceptable thing to say in any field even related to medicine. Medicine is and always will be dependent on science. This is because basic medical research involves figuring out how living organisms from the cellular level up to the whole animal or person work and what can go wrong with disease or injury. Having an understanding of the genetic code of a virus gives us the ability to figure out what kinds of chemicals can harm the cells of a virus within a person without causing harm to the person. Everything comes later. All my explanation, all my theorizing, all my great ideas of this or that or this theory, that theory, no. Once you see its effect, then we will talk further. No, absolutely not. And if what you're proposing is not backed by evidence, then it is not even a theory. It's only a hypothesis. We have plenty of examples of infections that most of us have had but then recovered from. Think about it like this. If you have a cold, I can tell you that if you eat chocolate every day, you'll recover within three days to a week. This won't be because of you eating chocolate, it'll be because of three days to a week going by, because that's how long a cold usually lasts anyway. The problem becomes when you believe that the chocolate was the cause of your recovery and you begin promoting it as a cure, especially when you begin claiming that it can cure other diseases. This is an illustration of the false cause fallacy. The false cause fallacy is the assumption that a real or perceived relationship between two things means that one is the cause of the other, or put simply, the assumption 
that correlation is evidence of causation. Scientists are well aware of this fallacy and it's the reason why in order to be approved, modern medicine requires an explanation for how it works so that it can be verified that the medicine was in fact the cause of the recovery. Don't criticize it on the basis of this or that. What is science exactly? Science is not what you can understand. There are many, many things you can't understand. So science is not based upon what is understandable. Science is based upon what actually happens. It's based on experimentation and observation. Science is the study of the nature and behavior of things within the natural world. Science is what gives us an understanding of living organisms and how they react to certain chemicals. So Rajan is wrong when he says that science isn't based off of what is understandable. Your explanation can follow later. Apples fell to the ground even before Newton discovered the law of gravity. So there are many things that happen which we don't understand today, but that doesn't dismiss it as a fact. Simply you don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. This is called shifting the burden of proof, which is a fallacy in which a person claims that the burden lies on a person who does not believe that a claim is true rather than the person making the claim having the burden to support it with evidence. Now let's get into how homeopathic solvents and tablets are made. The first principle of homeopathy is like cures like. In other words, remedies use ingredients which cause symptoms similar to the symptoms caused by the diseases which they set out to cure. For example, a remedy for fever could be made from belladonna since belladonna causes fever. Remedies for rashes might be made from poison ivy which causes rashes and remedies for bee stings might be made from bee venom. This may sound similar to the way the vaccines work, but it's not, and it's very important to know the difference. Vaccines introduce small amounts of altered versions of a virus into the body which provokes the immune system, causing it to create antibodies necessary to prevent the virus. Like Cures Like claims that substances which cause symptoms similar to the symptoms caused by the disease will cure the disease. So one sets out to cure, while the other sets out to prevent. The second principle is the method of preparation called patentization. Homeopaths believe that diluting the active ingredient in water actually activates and enhances their healing effect. For this process, the ingredient is dissolved in alcohol or distilled water. Homeopaths take one part of the solution and mix it with nine parts of water, diluting it to a tenth of its original concentration. Then it's put through what's called a succession, which is nothing other than a fancy sounding way of saying it's shaken. Now what you have is a 1x potency, named after the Roman numeral X for 10. Then this process is repeated. One part of the 1x mixture is mixed into 9 parts water. Then after it being put through a succession, you will have a 2x potency. This process is repeated over and over until the desired potency is made. Again, homeopaths believe that each time they dilute the mixture, its potency increases, which on a physical level actually makes no sense. As a teenager, did you ever drink some of your parents' liquor and fill the bottle back up to where it was with water in hopes that you wouldn't get caught? If you did this, then you know firsthand that diluting a substance with water doesn't increase its potency. In fact, it actually does the opposite. So why do homeopaths insist that for them, diluting these substances makes them stronger? The explanation that they give is that shaking the mixture after every dilution causes the active ingredient to leave behind a spirit-like essence in the water. So basically, the idea is that water remembers what's been in it. And whilst its memory of a long lost drop of onion juice seems infinite, it somehow forgets all the poo it's had in it. This is where poking holes in homeopathy becomes easy. First of all, the concept of water memory has not only not been proven by physics, it's actually been disproven entirely as we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that water does not maintain an alignment of molecules for any longer than a picosecond, that is, one trillionth of a second. Without water memory, the idea that diluting substances increases their potency is entirely debunked, leaving us to focus on just how diluted homeopathic solvents are. Most homeopathic solvents are 30x, which means that the process described earlier has been repeated 30 times. The final dilution is one molecule of medicine in 10 to the 30th power of molecules of solution, or one in a trillion trillion. At this level of dilution, you would need to drink 8,000 gallons of water in order to get one molecule of the original ingredient. The final dilution is one molecule of medicine in 10 to the 30th power of molecules of solution. 
At this level of dilution, you would need to drink 8,000 gallons of water in order to get one molecule of the active ingredient. Some other homeopathic solvents are 30C, which represents 100 to the 30th power. There isn't enough water in the entire solar system to accommodate this dilution. So, is there at least anything we can learn from homeopathy? I think so. Listen to Rajan talk about his consultations. Each individual has his own specific state of disease. And therefore, we need to study who the individual is. How does he react to heat and cold? What does he like in food and drink? How does he think? How does he perceive? How does he react? And then we need to select the exact remedy based on our assessment of who the individual person is. And that medicine can stimulate his own healing mechanism to produce a long-term solution to the problem. Hearing this immediately made me more understanding of homeopathy patients. If homeopaths are taking as much time and effort into these consultations as it seems, then the consultation itself could cause the patient to feel more confident and less worried about the disease, which may actually help them. But conversations can't cure cancer. So let's continue calling out the quackery that is homeopathy. The explanation usually credited for homeopathy working is the placebo effect. In a video subsequent to this one, I'll be discussing the placebo effect with Jamie Boone, the former president of the atheist community of Austin and host of the show Talk Heathen. As soon as that video's up, there will be a link to it in the description of this video. Today we learned about the history of homeopathy, what homeopathy is, why medicine depends on science, and how we know homeopathy doesn't work. We addressed the principles like cures like and patentization and went over the problems with Dr. Rajan Sankaran's answers for critics. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you were able to learn something from this video. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you haven't already and don't forget to look forward to my conversation with Jamie Boone about the placebo effect, which again will be linked in the description to this video when it's posted. Stay safe and don't forget to wash your hands.